am Lisa Saunders. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about something I really am interested in, but I don't know as much as I should about it. So I brought my friend on patio to talk about some things, right? Yes. And what are we going to talk about? Well, I've been collecting letters um, written by families in the New London County um, during the Revolutionary War. So I wanted to share some of those today. <clears throat> Now, New London County, Connecticut, for people yes. who are watching yes. this over, all over the world. <laughs> yes, New London, Connecticut. Um, basically, 10 years ago, I, when I moved back here, I started to get really <clears throat> interested in thinking about what it must have been like to live here during the Revolution. So every time I would look out at the ocean, I would imagine the British warships that were constantly parading back and forth between New York and um, Newport, and people were always worried that they could be attacked at any moment. So I really thought I wanted to get as close as I could to understanding what it must have felt like to live like that, to live knowing that you can't go to Long Island if you want to, to go visit your relatives because they're behind enemy lines. Oh, I never thought about yeah. any and of those so, things. And they couldn't come to see you unless they got specific permission to leave. And so... It just fascinated me to think that we had refugees here, you know, but from within our own country, people who had to flee and get to where they felt safe, either on the loyalist side or on the revolutionary, on the patriot side. So I've been mm. gathering letters, um, got quite a collection. So one of, I'm here today to sort of launch um, seeing what if people are interested in following the revolution through people's letters kind of month by month for the eight long years oh of the gosh. war. Oh my gosh, eight so, years. I forgot yeah, eight years. that it's so long. I didn't realize till I moved here in 2010 that Benedict Arnold attacked uh, Groton yes. at Fort Griswold and burned New London. You know, here that's just part of ingrained in everyone's historical sense of this place, whereas I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And my dad thought that was fascinating uh -huh. that I was moving to where yes. Benedict Arnold, you know, <laughs> performed know. his treachery. And I think it's fun that his, um, they burned him in effigy, what, every year a mm -hmm. theater group does? Yes. Like a two sided face yes. of him, and they burned him yes, in New London um, because he burned New London to the ground or yes. ordered it because he knew this area. He was from he Norwich, did. right? Yes, it's, and okay. he also I was in New London for a time and in New Haven. And so, yes, that's a whole, uh, books, many books have been written about that, and I think it would be a really interesting topic well, to explore. Well, that's another topic for another do time. another yes. show. Um, but it is fascinating yes. because a lot of people lost their husbands and fathers and brothers. Yeah in this area and I can't imagine what it was like to live on a daily basis looking out at the With water and being nervous. Yes. So, so you have some letters. Yes I do. For today I thought I would just focus on three families. Um, the first family is the um, Trumbull family. Jonathan Trumbull was the governor of Connecticut of the colony of Connecticut when war broke out. Oh, And okay. he was the only um, governor who remained in office because he supported the Patriots and none of the other governors oh. did. So he remained in office. He had um, four sons, three who participated in the Continental Army, and one who stayed home to help him with the family business. Mm -hmm. He was a merchant, and he also met every day in Lebanon. At a, he made part of the store. Lebanon, Connecticut. Connecticut. People yes. that don't watch us are yes. going, where's Lebanon? Lebanon, you can go and visit the actual building where he had his shop, and in the oh. back, every day during the war, he met to um, you know, figure out how they, we were sort of one of the provision states. How were we gonna help George Washington? What did he need and how could we get it to him? Oh. So that was the hunting, wow. uh, the Trumbulls. And I'm also focusing on, um, well they had two daughters, one, so their whole family overnight became completely absorbed in the revolution. Mm -hmm. One daughter's um, husband, Mary, her husband William Williams, um, was a delegate to the Continental Congress. So. He was gone for very long periods, and his other daughter, Faith, married one of the Trumbull family, um, I mean, sorry, the Huntington family Hunting. in Norwich, Connecticut. Okay. And they were extremely wealthy merchants with very close ties to Boston because their sons had gone to school there. And actually, Faith studied needlework for two years in Boston. You that can was, study that? Yes, and <laughs> she, she oh, has yeah. very beautiful pieces. Um, and the third family I want to focus on is a loyalist family who 
thought it would be permissible to drink tea and criticized the king and learned very quickly that it most certainly was not. Oh, so dear. Okay. I will start kind of going back a little bit to um, right after the Boston Tea Party, where they dumped all the tea, very expensive commodity, obviously, into the Boston Harbor in December 1773. Then the- Who dumped it? The um, it colonists. The colonists who dumped it. Who did not it. want to have to pay a tax on tea. And so if they had unloaded it, they would have to pay the tax. Oh, so that's they, why they, because I was a little confused. It. Why, okay. And it was a very expensive thing to do okay. because, and so, and it, you know, was very in, couldn't be more in your face to um, <clears throat> the British Parliament and the King. So when word reached them and then word came back, the word was that the Port of Boston was going to be closed, Ooh. which was unthinkable. I mean, that's how the wealthy men made their living and how their families existed. And that's how everyone else got things that were more easily transported by sea than on you know poor wow. roads and so it was a great um, a great shock and so the towns not just in Massachusetts but in other towns particularly eastern Connecticut we were very strongly supportive of the Patriots cause the western part of the state not so much but we were oh, mm -hmm. so um, on the day that the port closed, I was going to read what the town of Lebanon, where Lebanon, Connecticut, <clears throat> where Governor Trumbull lived, how they marked the day. Oh boy! And they okay. published this in the the newspaper had a little article about it. Okay. <clears throat> and so let me find this letter. They wrote, the cruel edict of the British Parliament respecting the town and port of Boston took place yesterday, and was observed here in Lebanon with marks of distinction. The bells of the town tolled a solemn peal the whole day. The townhouse door hung with black, and the shops in town were all shut and silent. At night, in the townhouse, the following resolutions were <clears throat> unanimously adopted. That we do all at this time heartily sympathize with our brethren in Boston. <clears throat> that we are heartily willing to unite our little powers in whatever general measure shall be thought best for the security of the just rights of our country. And so not just Lebanon, but throughout Eastern Connecticut, particularly towns ha held meetings and they literally voted to support Boston come oh. what may. And oh, so in okay. Norwich, um, they, this was what they came up with. Um, it was a long statement. I picked one part of it to read. We will, to the best of our abilities, assert and defend the liberties of British America, and we will cooperate with our brethren in this and other colonies in such measure as will be most proper to relieve us from the burdens we now feel and secure us from greater evils we fear will follow. So then the whole following year, everybody was on edge because the British kept sending over more troops, the port of Boston was closed. Uh, what was going to happen? Um, did they come in through Boston? These the troops, troops, yes, and they they took over Boston. And so, what I'm actually going to tell you about next. I'm is, a grown up. I should know all this, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That. Well, I don't happened? know New England history that well. People, so. you couldn't if you lived in Boston. You couldn't just blithely walk across and take your carriage and go to Cambridge. All of a sudden, the British general, who was also the governor, they got rid of. Um, they appointed him the governor and the general in charge of the military. And to leave the town, you had to have permission. And so Just suddenly the these town. people were hostages behind the lines. And there were many people, I think at least 100, uh, were refugees who came to Norwich. So um, to be able to come to Norwich, they were put under political, the political microscope, basically, because um, they had to get permission to leave and they had to get permission to come mm -hmm. because Norwich, in, in normal times, non-war time, um, you ha had to get permission to settle in a town. But here, in this particular moment, when there were all these people wanting to leave Boston and some were friends but, and, but had different political perspectives, 
So the people in Norwich were sort of uncomfortable. And oh, because so, they don't know who's coming into the town. Well, they, they know. They could be loyal to the king. Well, Is they that what actually you're knew because they, it, their friends, for example, the Quincy family, one of the daughters was a loyalist, and they knew it. And she was already in Norwich, and they thought, well, what are we supposed to do about oh. this? Is this okay? Okay. So um, one of the um, committee men from Norwich wrote to Joseph Trumbull, who was um, in Cambridge, with the militia, and he said, told him that the town held a meeting. And he said, we want to know the sense of the town respecting the admission of families of those from Boston who are inimical to the liberties of their country. The town voted that those persons would have to make a suitable recantation and then they might reside among us. Many, however, are dissatisfied with the vote as some loyalists are already arrived and many more are expected. They say it is inconsistent that we protect their wives and children while the men are in Boston destroying our friends and kindred. On the other hand, some say, well, they're women and children. Let us be humane. They cannot hurt us. Some are desirous of knowing the mind of the Provincial Congress. If you think proper, you may lay this before them. So right from the beginning, people were starting to look at each other in different ways. Oh, gee. And, I thought today was you tense. Know, <laughs> and it was very oh, tense. Oh, wow. And faith, you never really know who believed what, Well, right? a lot or, of people um, learned to not say anything if they okay. were loyalists. And, of course, there were some rabid people on both sides. But, right. But um, I want to read a letter now from Faith Trumbull Huntington. She married into the Huntington family and married Jedediah, and she as I said, was a beautiful needleworker, and she was a very sensitive, deeply religious person. And she wrote to her husband, who left immediately after um, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, went up to Norwich with his group of militia. And she wrote about friends from Boston who had already come and were staying with her father-in-law around the corner from her. And she said one of the daughters in the Quincy family was a loyalist, and another woman, Abigail um, Quincy, another Quincy, she supported the um, Patriots and her husband had just gone to England and, and to try to plead with Parliament and the King to understand the Patriots' perspective and try to back off from the precipice they were on. And um, her Abigail, Quincy's husband, on his way home, he was very sick when he went, so this was an extremely you know, generous thing that he did, knowing how ill he was, to go, and he was very, um, an amazing speaker and writer, and they thought he stood the best chance of possibly getting through to the Parliament. But he died just as the ship was returning to Providence, um, port, the port in Providence from England. So Faith wrote to her husband, we have been in great anxiety for the inhabitants of poor Boston, truly poor afflicted people. We have news today that the general has given more of them leave to depart. And then she wrote of her newly widowed friend whose husband had died on the ship. The poor woman, what she must have suffered. I have wept for her, deprived of her dearer part. But there must be some alleviation. He died in the country he was endeavoring to save from slavery and ruin. But I lose myself. These distressing days call forth all our passion. And then her husband. I don't, people were such eloquent writers. I know. That's <laughs> like now that we I, just text, you know. That's why I was reading some of the actual, some of the writing in the newspaper and the writing of the things that the governors were writing because a very big contrast with the, the what people tweet yeah. today, you know, <laughs> who were in a political office. So her husband wrote um, to the governor, his father in law, that um, he said, General Gage, who was the British general, his treatment of the town of Boston is wicked, infamous, and base without a parallel. He promised the inhabitants of Boston that they would have leave to come out of the town with their possessions. And of course, this was the elite, and they had many beautiful things that um, would be plundered if they were left behind. Mm -hmm. he, said they, he said they could take their possessions provided that they leave their arms. But now that they are disarmed, He's raising a thousand obstacles in the way of their coming. Oh, gee. He's determined that they can bring nothing of any value. Oh. And now they don't have so, their arms to protect their exactly. stuff. Exactly. And oh, so boy. in the meantime, 
the loyalist Ebenezer Punderson found himself in deep trouble because not only, as he wrote a memoir later of his experiences, and he said, I tried to convince great numbers that England had given America no just cause of complaint, and he also said he was going to drink tea in spite of the boycott. <laughs> and that sounds like such a, you know, an innocuous right. thing, but of course it symbolized everything. And so each town had a committee of inspection, of safety, of correspondence that they wrote to each other and they looked at the people in the town. So is this really why Americans, I think, are mostly coffee drinkers? Do you think that's still <laughs> no, handed think down from the generations? You will or? find in later letters, once the war got started, people asked their spouses who might be in New York, please bring me some tea. Okay. I mean, they, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know how we became coffee drinkers, but we were serious tea drinkers. And so Ebenezer um, came to the notice because he was so public in his store, constantly um, proclaiming what he thought. And so um, the Committee of Safety did not like this, and they, and they said, you need to come and meet with us. We want to talk to you about this. Well, he refused, and so the committee had a notice published in the newspaper, and it read, it appearing to the committee that Ebenezer Punderson has repeatedly drank tea in open contempt of the Continental Association, and has said in his own words that he means to continue in the practice, and that Congress was an unlawful combination, and that the petition from Congress to His Majesty was haughty, insolent, and rascally, which is, <laughs> it's going. funny to read, but that was a huge insult. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, the committee orders that no trade be carried on with him, and he ought to be held as unworthy of the rights of free men. So with that one letter, they basically jeopardized his entire financial future because, according to them, no one was to step foot in his store. So Ebenezer... Mm -hmm recognized that it was no longer possible for him to have freedom of speech. And he wrote an apology oh. very quickly. Uh -huh. And it was printed in the paper the next week. And it sounds Which nothing. Which paper is this? It like was the, there were two papers, the New London Gazette and the Norwich Packet. And I okay. think it was published in both. And he said, I'm s Ebenezer Punderson declares he's sorry he has drank any tea and will drink no more. <laughs> I will not do anything inimical to the freedom of America, and I ask for forgiveness for disrespecting the committee. And the committee did lift the boycott, and they published a notice in the paper saying so. However, the day that this appeared in the paper, which was usually four sheets, and this would have been probably on page three, but it was the same paper where they were going to um, discuss and publicize the um, attack on Lexington and Concord. Mm. So it was a, they created a special insert for the paper, had huge headlines that said, interesting intelligence from Lexington and Concord. And so basically, nobody was going to read. Where are you getting these um, newspapers? Oh, they're, they actually are online, which is really? wonderful. How, um, do you, what, how do you find them? I, um, there's some websites where you can pay to have access, and uh -huh. there are others I believe that are free. I pay because it's an easy website to, um, I, I use Geo Genealogy Bank, and I can get these very easily. And so, wow, um, this is just it's amazing because like, you're even knowing the size of the headlines yeah, and inserts. Yeah, so you can see and everything and where really, it appeared and yeah. how it really did get buried because they're going to look at the insert. And, and of course, the Sons of Liberty, who were not, you know, affiliated with any town or they had no particular clout, but they could be very violent if they so chose and very rowdy and, and you know, uh -huh. there was some tarring and feathering that happened. And so Ebenezer was petrified um, of what would happen next. Um, and he basically kind of stayed in, almost in hiding in his store. And in the meantime, Governor Trumbull wrote to the British general, kind of another last ditch. There were quite a few last ditch efforts mm -hmm. where they would write back and forth. And he wrote to the British general and he said, the inhabitants of this colony are intimately connected with the people of your province and are bound by the strongest ties of friendship. <clears throat> Why is the town of Boston now shut? Why do we continually hear a fresh destination of troops for this country? The people of this colony dread nothing so much as the horrors of civil war, 
but they are most firmly resolved to defend their rights and privileges to the last extremity. Be so good as to explain yourself. Is there no alternative but the desolations of war? Hmm. And so basically the Trumbulls and the Huntingtons, those families, they knew that um, there wasn't any alternative and that was what would happen. But, um, you know, there was still, I mean, we didn't actually write the declaration. So do you follow these three families that you talked about for the eight years of the war? Yes. Yes. Wow. And I'll, I catch you up on what happened. Um, basically, um, her husband, Faith's husband, was in, in Cambridge with the troops, and, you know, and he's very upset, and he actually wrote that um, the British are spreading fake news. The <laughs> British <laughs> had these circulars printed, and they distributed them everywhere and probably sent them. They're not sure if they got sent back to London, but the circulars were saying that the alarm was false, that really there was no attack. And then the Lexington uh, alarm, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They said, "Oh, d did not happen." Okay. And so, um, interesting. Yes. And it's a little harder to test whether something's true or not in those well, days. Well, I mean, if you're all the way over in England, yeah. you've got to really rely on your sources. But, um, and the second letter, he, um, you know, these these young men hadn't. I mean, they participated in like yearly militia, you know, get-togethers, but they had no training in war. And so um, Jedediah, or no, Joseph, writes to his brother um, in Lebanon and says, could you please find some military books for me? Because they literally had to wow. start, you know, teaching Learning themselves. how the art of war. The art of war, mm -hmm. yes. But even um, kind of another um, situation that became known right at this time was how difficult it was going to be to suddenly get the whole, all of the colonies not only behind the war but and prepared for war, but given what they needed to be soldiers. So um, he also writes, and Jedediah, Faith's husband, writes to Joseph um, Trumbull, who would, have, who would be soon appointed the commissary for the Continental Army, and that means he was in charge of procuring basically the all the food, all okay. the supplies, all the guns, you know, all the everything, blankets. And... Um, Jedediah said, you know, we're here in Cambridge. Our men have no thing to cook in and with, have no wood, will soon be out of pork, especially if any new recruits come in. Perhaps you have provisions for those things. So Joseph, right from the beginning, would be overwhelmed, basically, with um, <clears throat> the need. Yes, and to try to find this. And while these families were worrying about refugees, Ebenezer learned that he was going to have to become a refugee, a loyalist refugee, because he wrote in, in his memoir that an inholder told me, and this was in late May, that a number of soldiers who were at his inn the other night told him that I had but a little time to live, for that a number of them had sworn to take my life before they went to Boston, and they expected to march the next day. Whereupon, at 12 o'clock that night, I got into a small boat in Pakutanic Cove. You can still see where he left. Where is that? It's, um, it's part so. of um, Preston. Preston, very close Connecticut. To here. Yes. Okay. And so he rode himself down the river in the dark, <laughs> and he oh rode all the way to New London, Ooh. and he got on board. Outside the, the harbor was, of course, a British ship, because they were always there, kind of harassing, just there and making people feel absolutely terrified that at any point they would strike. Mm -hmm. So he got into one of these small boats and then he was taken to Providence where he went on board um, British warship the Rose which would become extremely well known for terrible reasons. Um, Isn't there a replica of it? Yes there is. Oh my it's, I think it's I mislabeled California. it in a book of mine. Oh. <laughs> well there's probably lots. But we only have we have like Three or four minutes left. So, what do you wish we had talked about? Or well, I was thinking uh, that I wondered if people would want to sort of know what happened to these three families. So, <clears throat> I will tell you that Ebenezer went to London because um, he figured the war would be over by Christmas, and he'd just go to you know be there. There were lots of not lots, but people had left who were uh, loyalists and gone there, and he just kind of wanted to hobnob with them. But then it turned out that. Um, you know, the war didn't end right away, and he ended so up... So don't tell us what happened. Okay, I won't tell you us You know what? what? Because 
we need to, you need to find out if people want to know more. Okay. Because you're already, you're going to do, I think, a lot of this work anyway, yes. whether they want to know, because you care. Years work. <laughs> and I love meeting with you for coffee, because sometimes you're almost crying. Oh, George, poor George <laughs> Washington, he just got this letter, and he thought he was his friend, but he was really a spy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you really feel these people, and I feel like you think they're still alive, maybe, <laughs> or they're still alive yes. through their letters, but yes. that's what makes it fascinating, yeah. is that I feel like they're alive, I'm, I'm, I'm reliving it. And that was my goal, to, through you. to see if I could capture that. So um, people should email you, what's your email address? It's pattyoat at gmail, P-A-T-T-Y-O-A-T -T -T at gmail.com. Com. Okay, mm -hmm. and if they forget what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> they can contact through my website, mm -hmm. um, authorlisasaunders.com or lisasaunders42 mm -hmm. at gmail.com, and I can get in touch oh, with great. you because they okay. see my email a lot. But um, I want to make sure people get in touch with you because I, I feel like that. you have a series, especially for people that are interested in Connecticut and Boston. You know, a right. lot of people... That's why I kind of backed up and made you talk about the tea party mm -hmm. and things, because a lot of people think they know what happened, but they're a little embarrassed. I'm like, yeah. I don't really remember what happened. Absolutely. And then they get There's distracted because so they don't remember what, yeah. what that was about. So um, I think people are going to learn a lot and feel it through you. Well, I so. appreciate you having me on your show today. Well, I hope Thank you come you. back on um, so we can get I to the next to. level. My <laughs> goodness, we've just, be we've just begun yeah. Yeah. here it's in Connecticut. Years. Yeah. Oh, we have a and lot to do, or you yeah. have a lot to do. <laughs> now, do you have a website yet? Not or a yet, blog? but okay. I hope to do that. I'm thinking of creating either a TV show or okay. a podcast, podcast? Okay. to be able to read these letters and bring these people, you know, up into the present so we can understand how hard Cause it Because I really think what, you're, what you read was very dense, and I think I people know. need to be able to visualize that. And remember, yeah. who is that again? I know. I, um, no, I know. So that's where I think yeah. a, a website would help so that you can maybe have a little yes, I flow chart. Doc, remember, this document. is this person, you know, you know how you do a who's who, of, yes. just so they can quickly look, because it is very interesting how you're getting this sense of people's reactions, but now we only have two minutes left <laughs> or less than. Yeah. So um, um, I just wanted to thank you for coming well, on my show. You. And I really um, hope people get in touch with you to yes. let you know, okay, I'd love this, but I'd love to hear no more right. this or yes. whatever. And are you available for speaking? Yes. Okay. And I, I do know that this, it was hard to not um, make it dense this time because I wanted to give everybody kind of the framework right. of what were the generals and the governors doing and thinking and saying to each other. But from this point forward, although there's lots of, you know, thousands of letters. I mean, I know. Uh, Washington himself wrote over But, but 20, people can 000. contact you but, to speak yes. to you, like you speak at groups and everything. Well, Patty, thank okay, you so much for you. coming on my show. <laughs> and I'll see you again for coffee okay, real soon. Great. <laughs> thank you so much for okay. joining us, and I'll see you next week.